Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hello, 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 everybody. This is Las Vegas, and we are talking about cannabis. This is uh, Nevada's Cannabis News Hour. And to my right, I have Kurt Dukoch. Hello. Raymond Fletcher, and we have William Beach Baker. And again, I'm Jennifer Solis. Today's episode, we also have Frederica Ballard, um, and she'll be on later in our show. But let's get started with local news. Local news. You know, I got an email the other day from the business licensing department saying that everybody that has a business license uh, for cannabis that also has a gaming license gets do-overs with their application. What do you think of that? That's just ridiculous. The The Gaming Commission warned them over a year ago not to get involved in this business, and they took the gamble. They did take the gamble. This is a gambling town. Raymond, what do you got to say about this? I, I don't think that's fair. You know, first and foremost, as Kurt just mentioned, they did issue this edict a year ago, and you have the elite of the elite, the power brokers, the money people of the valley here that are getting in on it. And unfortunately, the process made it so the mom and pop shops, so the patients couldn't get in on it. So the fact that those that are well-connected, those that are well-off financially, get to redo their applications after the fact, it's a slap in the face of the process, really. I, I think so. I, and I think it's not only a slap in the fr- face to the process, but it shows favoritism well-defined. This is a well-defined favoritism because they said, okay, people that have to redo their applications because of uh, because of gaming positions can get to re uh, reapply. Well, it's not really re- reapplying. It's taking the people out of their applications that they need taken out and putting those in. I'm sure that a couple of other people here in the state would like to get do-overs on their applications or to add or take stuff off of their applications, and, and they don't get that... that uh, of that privilege. Not only that, this is the second time that they're doing it. Remember, first, the percentage of ownership was discussed, and that information wasn't fully vetted and fully outlined in the application. So you had that do-over. Now you have this second do-over. And then, look, thirdly, you have communities losing out on their licenses because of the power grab by the uh, the commission. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's we we were discussing earlier. Uh, somebody was asking me earlier what they think that uh, the chances of cannabis being rescheduled was after the Eric Holder memo and and you know and all this other kind of stuff. And I I didn't really think that it would be um, viable until I heard that Harry Reid's son Key Reid is going for a dispensary application. Now, Key Reed's going for a dispensary application, and we all know that Harry likes to protect his family. So what do you think Harry's going to do to reschedule cannabis? I hope something. Well, Holder came out, and Holder did say that he was willing to work with Congress. And this is after our Senate Majority Leader, who should be working for, I don't know, the constituents, us, the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for him to have this epiphany and say, oh... I think marijuana is a good thing. I've seen it work. Well, where were you looking at the research over the years? You know, and look at all the marijuana that the federal government is buying up. If it's good enough for the federal government to buy up to do research on way over in Maryland, then it should be good enough for the patients who actually have a legitimate need for it. Exactly. We have we have a story that uh, that the United States government has bought over a thousand pounds of cannabis. What are they doing with a thousand pounds of cannabis? And you know, if they're buying it and doing medical research on it, isn't that de facto saying that there is medical use? And don't forget, they do have a patent on it. They do. They do have patent on it, and they also have patients that they supply cannabis to because it has been shown to be effective for those patients. There were thirteen patients, and I think there are like one left. 
and everybody There's else or four, four left, left four left four left so it's like everybody else is kind of you know succumbed to their illness or age or whatever else is going on with them now there are four people that the united states government are still supplying cannabis and at the same time they're saying no medical use no medical use yeah they just spent how much in our taxpayer money on acquiring how much marijuana and why why would they spend our money to buy it when they wouldn't just go to the police departments around the country and be like, hey, bro, you just busted somebody with like 20 pounds. Why don't you let us get it? We're the feds. I mean, come on. That's true. That's a good point, Ray. That's an excellent point. I mean, seriously, they've confiscated so much. And don't they destroy that after so long? They, they do a burn. They do a burn. Have you ever been around one of those burns? I would love I to wish. be around one of those burns. One time. <laughs> <laughs> Just one time. Exactly. So um, more in our local news, uh, June 5th. June 5th is in front of the count, uh, Clark County Commission. We have a meeting. Our- June 5th, the Clark County Commissioners are going through the... 209 applications that may have been submitted or resubmitted <laughs> or re resubmitted <clears throat> and then next week on the 21st the city of las vegas is going to go through the proposed regulations that were about as funny as the county regulations so have you seen have you seen revised um reports I- of city I have not, but I'm glad you brought that up because I need to mention this. I mean, okay, our elected officials, they take a beating for some things that they do, you know, and fairly so. Some of them deserve it. Exactly. That's why I say fairly so. But I have sincerely got to take my hat off to Bob Coffin. Oh. He was the only, only city council representative at all three of the meetings, and he was taking notes. And what's he doing now? Offering amendments to change these regulations because what did he do? He heard the people. Yep. Well, not only did he hear the people, he he continuously throughout all of these meetings, he would bring out his bottle of pain medication that he's on and tell people that he is seriously considering switching to medical marijuana because he sees that it might get him off of these hardcore narcotic narcotic prescription drugs that he's been taking so bravo to him i mean he he actually is listening to what we're saying up there and and i really can't blame him because you know look i i and as you well know i have steel rods in my legs mm-hmm. and i was taking two 750 vicodin a morning just to get out of bed and the amount that your system builds up of a tolerance you know and the side effects and everything else that we don't know that big pharma puts in us you know, it, it's just sad, and, and people are maligned and demonized because you smoke marijuana to get relief from whatever ailment you may have. But, geez louise, what if it was their child, their, you know, somebody close to them that needed their relief? You know, a parent would move heaven and earth to find relief for their child, and they should just, you know, it's sweeping the nation. It's I give it maybe two. By the next presidential election, it'll be a really big issue. Well, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that Obama will reschedule before he leaves as his little parting gift to America. That's my that's my hope. That's my favorite hope. Every time I see a shooting star, it's like, please, please, no, just plus, reschedule it to like three. The only way four. it'll get rescheduled, and, and I want you to mark the date and time I say this because it's going to be honest to God truth. All right. The moment it gets rescheduled is when. Um, Harry Reid's son gets that contract. Yeah. Yep. I'm 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 behind you on that one. I'm behind you on that one because when he first came out, uh, one of my little my one of my friends who's a Republican called me and said, "This is great. Harry Reid's supporting this." And I said, "The worm has turned." Um, because I and and the th- next thing out of my mouth was, "I bet you I bet you five hundred dollars that he has some type of investment or some type of interest in this." And when Key Reed's name showed up in the RJ as one of the people who was getting a dispensary, I called him up and said, "Guess what? I wish I would have shook your hand. You owed me five hundred bucks." So, you uh, Raymond, I, I fervently hope that his his son does get it get a dispensary as much as I don't like then you know all the money grubbing going on because I think that he'd want to protect his kid up in Congress and you know and reschedule it you know it's what can I do for my family not what can I do for the voters and it's and it's sadly 
more and more around the country it's getting like that you know and and you you hope people that get involved in politics that run for office do it for genuine desire to improve the quality of life of their community but unfortunately people are so into what can i do for me how can i enrich my family they lose sight of why they started that journey to begin with yeah, and that's and that's what I that's what I see a lot of a lot a lot of first term uh, legislators are really have those stars in their eyes and they are just not jaded to the process. And after one session, because we have such short, intense sessions, they come out of there with the you know, black circles under their eyes, and you know, and they've probably been approached by dozens and dozens of lobbyists with a lot of money you know just saying hey vote our way or do this or do that and you know it is disheartening but these people that also are jaded that's what causes other people to come up and go you know what i'm gonna run for that because i'm gonna do it right and i'm gonna help my you know community and i'm gonna and if you have enough money you can get voted in you know and that's that's the way of legislature almost and on that note, I, I would like to bring up that uh, Weekend is hosting an event this uh, this Friday w- with the Las Vegas Tribune, and it's a meet and greet with the candidates. And we're going to be having a whole gamut of uh, officials there. We're going to have senators there. We're going to have judges there that are running. We're going to have uh, school district people. We're going to have sheriffs. It's everybody across the board. And it, there's going to be food. And, you know, just if you want to come out and talk to these politicians and, and ask them the questions you want to ask, this is the place to do it. And it's being held at the Las Vegas Tribune this Friday at 5:30 and that's at 8:20 East Charleston and it's up on our it's up on our Facebook page and our meetup page so join if you want to come out and talk to these people and make a difference come and check it out you know and ask ask these people that are your elected officials what they think about the issues that are important to you and it, you know if you get a little pat and a nod and my office will contact you that generally means f you sorry but you know that's the Basically, that, no, that's the politician blow off. <laughs> you know, basically, you know, and and for those people, you know, that complain year after year after year, this is your opportunity to come meet the people that are running for office, get to know them, you know, and like Jen just said, talk about the issues that are important to you, not what they want to talk about, but what are important to you. And if after doing that, you still don't vote you have nobody to blame but yourself exactly right. exactly well, you you have to be a part of the process and if you're not part of the process then you're part of the problem look at the turnout so far around the nation for for these midterms it's it's abysmal it is but it, it, it always is abysmal in these in these mid you know in these midterm things but how many people sit and whine and complain and still well, you know, the thing is that, that together we can do it, and you know what? Divided we fall, but together we can we can really rise and, and do some good. That's why we host these types of things. These are not, these are bipartisan projects. Not Democrat, not Republican, not Libertarian, not Green Party. Oh, well, I like Green Party, but not <laughs> Green Party. Not Green Party. They're just things that make the a candidates more accessible to you so that you can walk up to them and if you don't feel comfortable talking to your city council member uh you know or your county commissioner you know give us a call well i'll go with you you know you know i have no fear well i don't know i always kind of i always kind of nervous when i see cops in my rear view <laughs> even if i'm not doing anything yeah absolutely well you know we do live in a police state somewhat so <laughs> Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> All right, we have um, something from uh, Minnesota. Minnesota state passes medical pot legislation. St. Yeah. Paul. Yeah, but did you see see what they're passing? They're they're saying that you're not going to be allowed to smoke marijuana. That you're going to have to take it in some sort of other form, either vaporizing it or in a pill form or uh, uh, edible, which you know. What, some, what, what do you think their What do you think their rationale is behind that? They want to curb smoking. Probably, I mean, if kids see people smoking, the kids might turn to smoking, whether it be cigarettes, tobacco, or marijuana. And on one hand, it, it on a health perspective, it's good yeah. because there are other forms of uh, taking your medication. Well, are they the allowing sex. vaporizing? Yes, they do allow vaporizing. Uh, 
So, I mean, but, you know, for some people, you know, smoking it, not vaporizing it is the only way that they can. Some people can't afford a, a vaporizer that costs five to seven hundred dollars, you know. So. Where are you going? Gold vapes are us? <laughs> well, you know, a, a good volcano digital is going to cost you, set you back $500 easily, you know, and oh. you've got to get the case to go with that if you want to protect it and keep it in good shape and your replacement bags. It, it's an expensive process, whereas a rolling paper, you get you know, 20 of them for $2. Well, you know, when I was a kid, they could be found in uh, the hotel rooms in every drawer next to the bed. Oh, <laughs> that was wrong. No, I'm not. I'm just saying. I mean, if, you, if that's, what, that's what you roll with in jail. Well, I mean, I don't know that personally. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> oh, my wow. goodness. Oh, my goodness. These bad influences. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I just say it. Tell it how it is. Maybe if it's funny, it's funny. But um, I hope that they, they like my comments in city council here on on the 5th of July or June, right? That would be the county commission is on the 5th of June oh, where they are opening the applications. And on the 21st of May is when they're doing the city council and they're voting on the regulations. I stand corrected. <laughs> well, we're going to go to a break here. And um, when we get back, we'll have our 420 moment and our guest, Frederica Ballard. Well, see you in a minute. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Welcome back. It's time for our celebrity spotlight and our 420 moment. And this week we are honoring... Cheech and Chong. Um, as you might know, Cheech and Chong are going to be in town on Friday after after the meet and greet at the Tribune uh, at the Joint uh, at the Hard Rock Live. So, and they're playing with War. It's Friday, May sixteenth at nine p.m. at the Joint Nightclub inside the Hard Rock Casino Live. Um, Tommy Chong's birthday is coming up on May twenty fourth. Um, he and Cheech Marin are best known for their Cheech and Chong movies. Um, I used to listen to them when I was young. Remember, they came on record and everybody... Dave's not here, man. Dave's not here, man. <laughs> um, What's your record? Up in, <laughs> <laughs> I, act, I actually had the Up in Smoke LP with the big bamboo rolling paper in it that was the size of, you know, the whole oh, album wow. folded out. I used it. I used it back when I was about... 2021 20, took it on a camping it? trip oh wow oh wow uh some of the people that uh cheech and jong have influenced and, and are chris rock adam sandler george lopez craig ferguson uh billy conley russell peters mitch heidelberg 
Ron White and Jackie Martling. Um, Cheech went on to star in or, or to be one of the co-stars of Nash Bridges, and um, I I really love the Cuda on that show. There was a Hemi Cuda on that, and also Don Johnson was on that show. So it was Don Johnson and Cheech uh, and Cheech Marin on Nash Bridges. And don't forget the 70s show. Oh, the 70s <laughs> show. But, you know, that was Chong. That was Tommy Chong, though, wasn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, like it a was. real stretch of character. That? <laughs> and also, uh, did you know that there's a Cheech and Chong Day? What What is Cheech and Chong Day? On August 11th, uh, 1972, Mayor John Gratti of San Antonio declared August 11th Cheech and Chong Day. Wow. That night, Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong performed on a set with Dan Hicks and his Hot Licks. <laughs> that just sounds funny. <laughs> it just, does. Uh, this 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 Friday they're playing with War though, and I'm not sure everyone's pretty familiar with War. You know the low rider and all that, so that should be a good show. It should be a good show. So come on out, meet the candidates, and you know if that makes you mad, then just come on out and laugh at Cheech and Chong. <laughs> That's right. That's my solution. Well, we're back from a break, and. Um, um, Kirk Dukach is joining me. So is Raymond Fletcher, Federico Ballard, and we have Mark Terbeek on the phone. Thanks, Jen. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Uh, well, thank you for having me again. No problem. No problem, no problem thank you Mark. For coming back. Um, we are going to into our the second half of our show, and I'd like to talk to Frederica about um, her experiences with cannabis and um, maybe the law and CPS. Um, I first heard about Ms. Ballard about three years ago, three years ago, and when I was asked to come in to some uh, sessions at CPS, and I sat, I sat through several court sessions um, and listened to her story. And it, it moved me in a way because she wasn't, they really didn't take the children for any reason. Can, can you just, you know, come in on, and Frederick and tell us what's, uh, you know, what led to the children being taken maybe? Yeah, sure. There was a, um, there was an un necessary police presence that was uh, brought to my home about three years ago in regards to a situation that had nothing to do with uh, cannabis or my kids, nothing like that, um, which resulted in my children being taken and taken into CPS as a legal patient, card-holding patient of Nevada. Um, our rights were not observed. They were not... Um, our, the, the law here in Nevada, NRS 453A, was not followed. And so subsequently, because of that, my children were taken into custody of the state of Nevada and have remained there. Well, and when, when I was in the CPS hearing, uh, I remember it, it was basically just kind of like two of your other children were loud and kind of fighting with each other. It was basically kind of a noise complaint. Right. So it, it, it went from a noise complaint to this extreme action on the part uh, of CPS and then um, in an effort to in an effort to to justify what they were doing then they kind of just it kind of snowballed can you tell us a little bit about that um, the evening that they were taken um, yes we um, my children were taken into custody by CPS um, I was told by my my CPS caseworker um, that they were taken because there was marijuana in the house that we were legal patients and that the, unless we were to um, give up our cards and forego the use of cannabis whatsoever in our lives that we were looking at being charged with uh, child abuse and neglect uh, over um, my children being in, in a home with legal patients. Now, the reason that so intrigued me was that I'm a mother and that I have children that are under 18 and it concerned me because I was like, well, what if I'm in my home and I start screeching like a banshee or I'm laughing at something really loud and the police come to my house and just kind of, it, it just snowballs. Yeah. And then, and it it has been such a mess for you and so heart rendering. Um, they, then subsequently, then the children were taken out of state illegally. Yes, actually my children, uh, I was coerced into case plan um, and... Upon completion of this coerced case plan, 
my children were taken out of the state of Nevada on an illegal ICPC under the guise that they were going to visit a family member when in fact it came to light that they had already submitted adoption paperwork for my children and this was well before we had reached the time line in a CPS case where that kind of stuff goes forward. So yes, they were taken out of the state of Nevada and to the state of Missouri on an illegal ICPC where they remain today, even though I have been acquitted of those child abuse and neglect and endangerment charges. Wow. Wow. So once you are entangled with the CPS and with the system, even if you prove yourself innocent, it can still be a, a, a huge legal tangle just to to remove your self and your children for um, from these circumstances. Mark, you, you've been listening in to, to kind of some of this. Is a, what, what are your some of your thoughts on this? Well, um, you know, it's a shocking situation and um you know, there's a there's a lot of things that go into these types of uh, enforcement actions. Uh, you know, one is is they tend to go for vulnerable people, people who they believe don't have the means to stand up and challenge them. Uh, this this is about the most egregious uh, action I've heard yet, particularly since the children are still uh, out of state. May, may I ask, uh, uh, are there adoption proceedings? Have they terminated your parental rights? What, what's going on with that? Yes, my parental rights were terminated uh, last year, actually, before uh, before I ever even saw uh, trial for these charges. And this was uh, this was Metro. This is uh, Las yes. Vegas City Police. Yes, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Yeah, Metro. Mm-hmm. I mean. To say that uh, the Las Vegas Metro Police Department are, are uh, jackbooted thugs is to insult jackbooted thugs. <laughs> there's, a reason, there's a reason there, there are peace officers out there, and uh, some of my clients and friends are among the, the guys, and there are people that we call pigs, and there's a reason why they're called pigs. And the Metro sounds like pigs. Yes. They're the whole system, the cops, the, uh, the CPS, these are people that uh, don't care for the rule of law. So, I mean, what I what I um, what I say to to that is for people out there listening is um, if CPS is uh, uh, has you in their sights for cannabis, say whatever you need to get the kids back and flee the jurisdiction. Don't let yourself get uh, brought into whatever you do. If you can, if you have, it all can do it. Don't let yourself get hauled into and subjected to uh, a dysfunctional, unjust, doesn't follow the rules system. Yes. You are not obligated to follow the rules when you're dealing with a system that knows no decency and won't follow the rules. Well, I tell you, I will tell you, Mark, that when. Um when this originally happened, and and I was listening to what was going on, Frederick was ordered by the CPS judge, um, uh, the j- hearing master, to take these classes um, for drug diversion or whatever. And she took substance the class, uh, substance abuse, uh, substance abuse, and she took the classes. And the, at the end of the class, she had to test clean. But because these are federally mandated classes or they're federally put on because she could not test clean for cannabis, which she had a card for, then they told her that she failed the classes, even though she went to every single class. And I was in court when they acknowledged that she went to every single class and that she did well and that she followed the the rule of their law right until the time that they drug tested her and said that she either passed the course or failed the course. And their own person from the, that drug class, that substance abuse class, came up there and said, no, she did great. Yep. She responded well. She did this. Yep. She did this. But unfortunately, because these are federal classes, yes. it, she has to test clean of every substance. And I went, how wrong is this? And now because she didn't test clean, it, that she is they're saying that she didn't complete the classes when the person that taught the class got up there and said yeah to my to my um satisfaction she did complete the class and it's just this one rule yeah and at that point i went this is crazy this is insane and oh my gosh this is scary 
Well, this this illustrates something too. That this is a little bit different. We, uh, a few weeks ago, we had a uh, guest on the program that was in a uh, family law custody dispute with the, the mother of his children, and this is a little bit different matter because this is a uh, CPS. This is a state agency, which is given a lot more deference than uh, a couple of parents that are fighting over custody of the kids. So you're in a you're in a deeper hole when you're dealing with uh, with CPS. And it just illustrates the need for joining in with uh, advocacy organizations that can make a difference in in these types of situations. Because I'd like to think that uh, the situation is a little bit different now than it was three years ago. Uh, we've got a lot more support for cannabis normalization in a lot of places. It's a completely different world than it was three years ago. But the facts on the ground, the politics have changed, but the facts on the ground haven't really changed as to the medicinal use and the efficacy of cannabis. Uh, and it's it's getting in uh, a few bucks to an advocacy organization. A few bucks isn't going to get you a lawyer to fight the case. Uh, collectively, a few bucks to an advocacy organization can change the framework to um, prevent this type of thing from happening. Because right now, I would think to for Metro to try something like this, they would be facing a lot more resistance. You know, I, I kind of do agree. I think that um, it does help people to have advocates in the courtroom because when there are advocates in the courtroom, the judge sees that people are paying attention to what's going on. And when people pay attention to what's going on, then they have a little bit harder time sliding this stuff by. This is true. Um, uh, sunlight is a very good disinfectant. <laughs> Right, well, uh, Frederica, I'm, I'm really, really sorry to hear about uh, how that uh, happened and, and for the parental rights to be terminated for cannabis use is a tragedy of yes. the first order. And uh, your, your experience can be an instructive lesson uh, to everybody who is in your situation that basically if you're not careful or if you don't have an advocacy group or a, a, a groundswell of support and you're a cannabis user, your very relationships, your very core family relationships may be threatened. And uh, that's what we all are trying to prevent and, and deal with uh, in this continually changing environment, positively changing environment. For sure. I know that um, she, we've supported her. We can has come, um, you know, come out and support her. And I come out personally when I don't have to work or, you know, have don't have something going on. But uh, the human solution has also come yes. out and helped her. Um, and it and it's getting these people together to, to shine the light on these situations that, that kind of make people stop their role. Slow your role, CPS. Guess what? I think that you're just kind of, you know, inflicting, you know, hurting people's civil rights by by doing some of the stuff that they're doing yes. um and then then trying to justify those those actions become a lot harder when you have 25 people you know from all walks of life sitting there staring at you going really really this I could have, be me i have filed as pro se um a 1983 civil medical marijuana suit against the state of nevada for the um abduction of my children Oh, you have launched such a lawsuit. You have. Yes. yes. Beautiful. Who's your attorney? Let's um, let everybody know who the attorney is. I have started it pro se. You've started so you're in you're in uh, you're in pro se uh, on that one. Uh, yes. Uh, representing yourself. Well, For right um, now. Well, uh, I tell you what, uh, I'll be happy happy to talk to you more about that uh, offline. Okay. Uh, and uh, give you some uh, hints on how to how to proceed on that one, uh, because there it is something that is warrant it's worth fighting. Given, Absolutely. Uh, given the irregularities of the process they did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make sure that she has your number offline, Mark, so that Great. she can give you a call also. You know, pe people need to remember that this is Brian Sandoval's CPS. You know, he's the one that signed the law that allowed for patients to grow their own and all this other stuff. So somebody had to sign that law. So on the one hand, he's saying it's okay. But on the other hand, he's allowing CPS to take these actions. Something doesn't smell right here. Yeah. You know, and again, that's why I say to everybody, it's important to get involved in elections at all levels. Because it's her children being abducted today. Who's, children, who's to say that? Is, yeah. You're right. It's next. It's next. Because they are doing 
what is legal under the laws of the state of Nevada? No, well, that, that's a that's a debatable point, and I, and I gotta say that's one one point of view is they 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 think they're doing what is legal under the law of the state of Nevada, but they're also impairing a constitutional right, which is the supply of cannabis and the right, the constitutional right of people with qualifying medical conditions to use it. Um, and one of the one of the things that's developing in some of the state laws, Michigan's law, uh, which I'm poking my nose into now that they've uh, they've started doing it, Michigan's law specifically uh, has a provision that says that uh, the use of medical cannabis will not be considered adversely in any uh, custody issue or any issue with regarding, regarding parental responsibility or rights, which is one of the first laws I've seen in the country that uh, really do that. And uh, that's something that uh, we should work on with, uh, with Nevada's law. I think an, uh, an amendment, uh, we need to really get an amendment in Nevada's law that specifically... Uh, takes away uh, CPS's and governmental authorities' uh, power to impair relationships simply based on the medical use of cannabis. I mean, yes. Nevada's law has a, has a provision to protect, in a way, protect your rights as an employee for use of medical cannabis. You can't just be willy-nilly fired for that uh, absent some significant uh, circumstances. There should be something about parental rights here, too. There definitely should, because, you know, it, it not only, and that's a great point, not only does it harm the relationship between the mother and the child, but also the mother and the siblings. You um, you have additional children, yes. besides the ones that were taking away, mm-hmm. Psalm um, and Nathan were, were removed from the state, but you have additional children, uh, Daniel, uh, William, or Billy, mm-hmm. and Hannah. Yes. And how, how has it impacted those relationships? Um, badly. It has been very hard to watch my children uh, suffer through the loss of their sibling bond and try to work out this issue with no help from the state. Um, it, it's, to me, it has been akin to somebody coming up to the fabric of your family and pulling two of those strings out, and then you pretend like there's no hole left where... They're no longer a part of it. And, and everything is just kind and, of unraveling. Yeah, and they just want you to act as if this is normal. There's nothing wrong with this, when in fact there's everything wrong with it, and it's not normal at all. It's horrible to go through, absolutely horrible. You know, and that, and that in, in the state of Nevada, uh, I've been told at family court that they want the children with the parents, if at all possible, and there's no violence and, and this and that. But when CPS gets involved, it's like people have to justify their jobs by, by standing by their guns. And, you know, if they would just put like a human face and in, in have feelings for this instead of saying, well, we're doing what's best for the children, how in that in any way, shape or form can be you know, justified as this is best for our children. Right. Well, Isn't know, that up to the parent to decide? Well, I, I think so. Um, well, we're coming up on a break, and when we get back, we will discuss um, the CPS and um, many more issues. Uh, we'll see you in a minute. We'll hear you in a minute. Bye. Did you know... That over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications. Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119, 702-388-1119, or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you. The Week at 702 Nevada Catalyst News Hour is the nation's only broadcast radio show where you can get the latest news from Nevada and beyond. Learn about the local billion dollar industry and cannabis reform revolution, which is sweeping the nation. Join host Jen Solis and their guests every Tuesday afternoon from 4 to 5 here on KLAB. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. The Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour this Tuesday afternoon at 4. 
Welcome back, everybody. Joining us in the um, joining us in the studio is myself, Jen Solis. We've got Kurt Dukoch, Raymond Fletcher, Frederica Ballard, and William B. J. Baker. Um, we were just discussing uh, CPS, and oh, and we have Mark Terpeek on the phone. <laughs> Um, we were just discussing uh, Frederica's case and CPS and the whole entanglement process. Um, I was I was privy to uh, this situation because I was in the court many times um, in the CPS courtroom many times uh, with Frederica and her and her family, and some of the points that were brought up were were shocking to me um, that CPS didn't even follow their own rules of of order. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that um, CPS never followed their own law in regards to visitation even with family with me in particular being the mother um, and I had to find this out as I was going along the way and going and, and reading and researching I had had my court-appointed attorney take me by the face and tell me Frederica you know I'm a Christian and I would not lie to you you can't this system is corrupt you will not win just fighting it because I was I didn't understand why telling the truth was not enough why I was being told I couldn't do that and get my kids back that made no sense to me. Now I understand that she was telling me the truth, that it's it's a business. Well, not only that, it was after your children had been, not only that, which is heinous enough, but not after your children had been taken away from you, the case manager went on sick leave mm -hmm. and then never turned it over to another case manager who yep. followed through. That's true. And so she not and so then when you came back into court and you're telling them this, they're getting irate with you, and now yes. they have to justify that they they did they did correct things. Yeah. And I was just I was appalled, I was appalled and yeah. sickened. That was one of many many things that they did that were very appalling, that were illegal. They we were breaking their own law in the custody of my children. It's uh, it's been very hard to believe having come from a family a local family here in law enforcement having been raised in the way that I was to see this how dishonest and uh, not truthful the system actually is and I'm not saying that there there isn't a need for it yes there are parents out there that abuse their kids and there are children that need protection I understand that but this is simply a case of CPS continuing that mindset that marijuana is illegal here in the state of Nevada and it is not it has been legal for 13 years that's long enough for you to make some changes and some education in your system so that things like this don't happen my grandchildren were also taken because of this same incident and I was told to my face by my son's caseworker that those children were taken for him being present in in his home at the time with a legal medical marijuana grow going on those were the grounds for why they took my children. I was told that numerous times, and then I was told that to my face about my grandchildren being taken as well. That, to me, is unacceptable. That is as if you are targeting the cannabis patients of Clark County so that you can take advantage of their ignorance and steal their children. That's not acceptable. It, you know, it sounds more pointed than just the cannabis patients of Nevada. It actually sounds like they've got a beef with you. Yeah. And And that's what... I kind of picked up when I was in the courtroom that it was just that you were like standing up there, you know, pounding the pulpit saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't right. And somewhere along the path, it became about how dare this person stand up and say that we're not right. I don't care if we're not right, but how dare she say it? Yeah. As if I had no right to fight for my children, as if there was something wrong with that. I remember a psychologist during this telling me, uh, when I was explaining to her that they were telling me that I had issues with being angry, uh, she straight said to me, she said, if you were not angry over your children being taken, I would think there was something wrong with you. Of course, I'm going to be upset. You have taken my children, my babies. How do you expect me to respond to that, especially when I have done nothing wrong and they have done nothing wrong, but they have ended up being the prisoners of this war? It is them that have been taken into custody for three years and taken out of the only home they have ever known, the only family they have ever known, and stuck in a home with strangers. And now, of course, in order to write that, they took them out of Nevada and put them uh, with my mother-in-law in Missouri. But that was a mother-in-law. They didn't, they didn't know that grandmother. 
They didn't so, know that, Grandmother. No. And, and there was something else that was mentioned that kind of just stuck with me. Both the grandmother and the grandmother's uh, significant other yes. smoke like trains yes. in the house. Tobacco. <laughs> and and around the children. And pot around the children. Yes. And, and, um, and that that somehow is okay that they yep. can sit in this miasma yep. of, of tobacco smoke. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you were to, you know, grow your cannabis around them, then, yeah. then you're bad. Yes. And they've been exposed to domestic violence over in Missouri as well, yet they have not removed them from that home. So it, that these key things that they took my children over, supposedly, in court, um, don't matter, I guess, in another state when it's being done by somebody else, supposedly. It's the hypocrisy and the double standard is amazing. That's insane. It's insane. Do you have any more uh, court uh, court cases, or do you need any more court support? Because you know, I do. If you, if you do, you mm-hmm. just um, you need to just uh, text me or or email me or put them okay. up on our Facebook, and I'll make sure to put a call out for people to come into court for you. Because you know, just like Mark was saying, um, if we can shine light on on these people and the and the wrongs that they're doing, suddenly you know people start behaving. Um, well when a lot of people are looking at them yes so Mark do you do you uh, agree with that yeah I mean uh, it, it, is, it is one of the a fundamental truths particularly in a broken and corrupt system is that the people who are pulling the levers of the broken and corrupt system don't want you to know what's going on so when you start shining a light on things they behave differently Absolutely. it's actually a, a it's actually a, a principle of of uh, quantum physics that that things that are observed will behave differently than things that are unobserved. So yeah, uh, show up, uh, advocate, be present. Uh, it'll it'll make a difference now, uh, even if you don't see it, and it'll make a difference later. You know, uh, I was just, I'm looking at this article here, um, I think in the RJ, and it says here that Nevadans are least likely to volunteer and to donate to charity. Um, Yeah, we rank right with Kentucky, tied for last. (laughs) Tied for last. (laughs) You know, I am happy to say that I don't. I I know that when we go out as we can and we're and we are looking at d- different things and we are advocating for different people that I have about the same 15 to 20 people show up. And the only time that more people showed up I think is when we were protesting, let's see we were we were protesting the federal courthouse when all the federal raids happened in 2010 i think we had i think 35 or 40 people show out for the show up for the protest on that day um but you know despite this gallup poll that says that we're we're one of the last you know the last states for volunteerism you know i'd like to think that people in nevada the cannabis community in general can pull together more than than last place i think that we all are caring people um and that and that we should be able to get way more than last place for showing up for 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 events what do you think ray sadly we're the last place in education as well do you think that there may be a tie to that? If we educate people more, that they'd be more more likely to give? I think there needs to be a lot more community involvement. What happened to civics? I had civics, you know, even though I don't know what a record is, I had <laughs> civics in school. <laughs> so, you know, com- community involvement. Those that don't have uh, community involvement are less likely to be the ones that contribute. You know, you got, okay, your local school, great example, your local school doing a fundraiser car wash, your community members, they send their kids to that school. Okay, let's help the kids out. The kids have their event. The kids see the parents saying that, they pay it forward, a life lesson. The kids aren't getting that life lesson. I happen to completely agree with that. It's a a systemic thing. It happens to be more pronounced in certain states, uh, you know, such as Nevada, and I would suspect outside of particular places like you know, Las Vegas or Clark County, um, probably particularly in the more uh, outlying pl- places in Nevada, it, it, the, the concept of community, of pulling together 
uh, has been twisted and, and warped uh, and replaced by this concept of individuality, that I can do it all by myself, and everything is, is I, I did it, I, I, I. Of course, these people will drive on the roads, uh, not wondering where did the roads and who, who built the roads and who built the schools and who's funding the schools and that sort of thing, which is coming back to a community view of things. So, you know, to the extent that people are more um, viewing things more as a we society than a me society, you're probably going to see more volunteerism. And it gives lie to the concept that uh, the more large social support you have, like with government intervention, results in less volunteerism. I think that uh, if you look at that state by state, you'll, you'll find just exactly the opposite, that where there is a, a, a larger community sense, a volunteerism sense, that bleeds through not just in how you act with one another and volunteer with one another, but the kind of society you support that helps support larger pe- people on a larger level. You know, I think that that is that is true. That's one of the reasons we're called We Can. Um, when uh, we were originally looking at the name and the idea, uh, there were different things bandied about. I can, uh, you know, s- stuff like that. But uh, following President Obama's lead and We Can, yes, we can, yes, we can. I was like, you know what? I think that that is that is better. We can, not I can, because I can't. I can't. I can't alone. No, absolutely yeah. not. We need we need the help of our volunteers, and we have some great volunteers with us that come out every first Friday in the heat of the summer and do the things they need to do to help us put our events off and stuff like that. But you know, we we need more to do more. That's true. Beach Beach comes out and volunteers. Beach has been with us since the beginning, and mm-hmm. and you know I value his help and and all of his knowledge and mm-hmm. and his time here. And you you come every first Friday. You're there. You're there for me. And you're there for us. Well, we have some great volunteers that help set up First Friday, which allows us to be down there, like William and uh, and Twista, Jay and Larry and Robert Walker. They're there every First Friday, and they work a 10 to 12-hour shift helping them set up and break down the event just so that we can be there and not have to pay the outrageous fees to set up our booth. Sure, and, you know, they volunteer, they volunteer for First Friday. They actually volunteer for First Friday so that it kind of pays for our spot there. And those people are so so vital to our community um, that you know we I you know we have parties and we we have different ways of showing our appreciation for these people that volunteer for us um, but I was I was questioning somebody the other day don't don't people know what a service you know what a service uh, community is you know you have you have things that you do that you get paid for and you know I get paid for my my animal advocacy and my animal nursing and stuff like that but when I took on this project I looked at it as a philanthropy type thing not what I'm going to get at the end what I'm going to benefit at the end you know what my what my thanks is and what my benefits are for this is to see that I've helped people and made a positive impact in the community when I hear people oh Wow, we're almost off the year. (laughs) But, you know, together we can um, make a difference. And thank you, Federica, for calling, coming out. Thank you for Raymond for coming out. Beach and uh, Kurt. Thank you, Mark, as always, for joining us and giving us excellent, excellent uh, law advice. And we will see you next week. We'll be back next week. Together we can. Thank you.